In our scripture reading this morning, we join Jesus and his disciples as Jesus is coming off a long marathon journey through the countryside where he's been healing the sick and feeding thousands of hungry people, teaching in parables and proclaiming the good news of God's love for his children. If there had been opinion polls in Jesus' day, they would have shown that Jesus was probably at the peak of his ministry. People were coming to him, after all, to hear him preach. They sought him out for healing, for physical, mental, and spiritual healing. But in spite of his popularity, Jesus had a few things on his mind. He knew his days were numbered and that he wasn't exactly the kind of Messiah that people were expecting. And he wasn't even quite sure that this team he was trying to build with these 12 men were ready to carry on his work when he was gone. In the verses we're about to read, we find Jesus and his disciples in Caesarea of Philippi, which is in the far northeast corner of Israel, some 30 to 35 miles northeast of the Sea of Galilee at the foot of Mount Hermon. And all, is that, and all of that is for those of you who like geography. Hear these words as found in Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 13 through 20. And if you are following along in your pew Bible, it's on page 18 in the New Testament. <coughs> Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words that I share this morning in this meditation and the thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you and you alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. That Jesus and his disciples travel to Caesarea Philippi is significant for several reasons, but I'm only going to share two of them with you this morning. First, Caesarea Philippi was basically a Gentile community. And no self-respecting Jewish leader would dare go into a Gentile community because Jews and Gentiles didn't mix. Jews thought they were unclean if they associated with Gentiles. So by being here, Jesus bought a little time to be alone with his disciples. Secondly, pagan worship dominated the landscape of Caesarea Philippi. Pagan temples were everywhere, each one more elaborate than the next, or the last. They were all elaborate. You couldn't walk 10 feet without tripping over one. You know, I think Jesus deliberately took a little field trip with his disciples to Caesarea Philippi with its background of pagan religions and probably positioned himself so that as his disciples looked at him, 
there was in the background all of those temples. When he asked a very simple and innocuous question, who do people say that I am? Well, the rumor mill then, as it, as it is today, works very well. And so this was a question that was very easy for the disciples to answer. Oh, some say, you're John the Baptist, the loner who preached fiery wrath and wore a coat of camel's hair and ate honey and locusts. Others say, you're Elijah, the great prophet whose return will be a prelude to the coming of the, of the Messiah. But you know, the last time we saw him, he was ascending into heaven, not coming down. Still others say, you're Jeremiah, one of the greatest prophets Israel ever produced. Then, then Jesus looked at his disciples and, and asked the, that's capital T, capital H, capital E, pop quiz question that he really wanted to ask. Who do you say that I am? There's nothing like being put on the spot, is it? The question seemed to freeze them. They all choked. And not just in your ordinary, uh, I don't know, kind of freeze. It was one of those duck your head, deer in the headlights. I know, I should know this answer embarrassed kind of freeze that immediately is visible on your face, even though you're trying very hard not to show it. If you remember in school when the teacher said, we've got a pop quiz, and you didn't look at her because you thought if you didn't look at her, she wouldn't call on you. <laughs> Do you remember those days? <laughs> That's the kind of situation I think the disciples found themselves in. There must have been dead silence. And after what must have seemed like a very long time, Simon Peter, the disciple voted most likely to fail, the least likely to succeed, said, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Simon Peter, this was Simon Peter, the disciple who made a career out of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time finally got it right. Jesus had to have been ecstatic. Simon Peter got it. And Jesus blessed him by saying what? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. You now are Peter, the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. And you can just imagine that with Jesus' arm around Peter, they begin walking down towards Galilee, and as they walked, Jesus began teaching the disciples about what was waiting for him in Jerusalem. Suffering, injustice, the cross, death, resurrection. And then Peter did it. He stuck his foot in his mouth again and said, God forbid it. He tried to dissuade and tempt Jesus not to go to Jerusalem. And, and this made Jesus angry. And he said, get behind me, Satan. Poor Peter. Bless his heart one minute. He was blessed. And the next minute he was compared to Satan. He may have passed the pop quiz, but as many of us have found out, just because you get the answer to one question right doesn't mean you pass the whole exam. Fortunately, later he did. Peter would let Jesus down again in a matter of days outside the house of Caiaphas on the night, he was, on the night Jesus was arrested when he denied him three times. As I worked with the text this morning, I daydreamed a little about giving you all a pop quiz. 
but decide that was not a good idea. So I'm not going to do it. But what if I had just read the scripture and then handed each of you a pencil and a piece of paper with one question on it? Who do you say that Jesus is? How would you have answered? In agreement with Peter, some of you may have written down the words found in today's text. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Others might have echoed the words of the disciple Thomas when he beheld Jesus after the resurrection, my Lord and my God. Still others might have written, Jesus is the best friend I've ever had. Who do you say that Jesus is? Oh, we, can, we know the, the titles and we can recite them. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the second person of the Trinity, our Lord and Savior, our Comforter, our Redeemer. But what do these titles mean today? Would our answers be any more complete if we simply listed words that describe what we mean? Jesus is loving, gentle, compassionate, understanding, forgiving. What about Jesus is my helper, my guide, my friend, my God? Simply put, who is Jesus? To you. This is the pop quiz question that we as individuals and as a community of faith have to answer many times during any given day, often when we least expect it, and many times when we really don't want to deal with it. As individuals, we answer this question as we go about our daily routine at home, at work, at school at leisure. We answer it in how we use our resources, in how we treat others, in how we face life's challenges, in how we conduct our devotional and prayer life. Sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we don't. Collectively, as a community of faith, every policy, procedure, publication, practice that we have and make, every decision we make, the way we respond to the needs around us, the way we offer or don't offer hospitality, our worship, our fellowship times, discipleship opportunities, and the expectations we have of each other all answer the question, who do you say that I am? Sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we don't. This morning as we take communion, we will eat the bread and drink the juice in remembrance of Jesus the Christ. And this is certainly one answer to the question that he asks. But this is an easy answer to give in this time and this place in this service of worship. But what happens when we go beyond these doors to our everyday life? The answer we give here may be quite different sometimes than the answer we give out there. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? As we come and take communion this morning, Think about this question. Think about what you are saying. Think about who Jesus is to you and the difference that it makes in your life.